everybody. Welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. It is your Friday edition. Cheers. A nice uh, fresh glass of Elijah Craig small batch to cheer us on for this Friday afternoon. Hope you all had a great day. Uh, I decided I would, I would attempt to circumvent a YouTube copyright infringement by playing a little bit of thematic music in the background for the dreaded Friday the 13th. Chop, 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 chop. Don't worry, I won't let this run the whole show. Just thought I'd have a little bit of fun with some music in the background, but we won't do that for you. Uh, today's going to be pretty much all listener questions. I had a bunch of them, and those that did send in questions, thank you so much. I will do my best to get to all of them as we progress through today's show. Uh, I'll probably do a market recap at some point, but I want to start off by going into something I think touches kind of all points of the market, which is a question that was sent in from Tom. And uh, oh, by the way, I don't know if you guys saw this one. I, I had some fun with this one. And yes, Katie says I need to update that picture. Yeah, I think that picture's from February, maybe March. Maybe it's time for a little bit since I got the facial hair gone. I'll have to upgrade that one for you. But I, I was having so much fun with this whole Four Seasons landscaping thing. I thought maybe I'd go out to Philadelphia, go to Four Seasons landscaping. No, I did not go to the X-rated movie place right next to it. But uh, unfortunately, Rudy Giuliani and team was not there. But I... I did manage to grab myself a t-shirt to make America rake again from the Four Seasons Total Landscaping. It's lawn and order out there. Anyway, a little chuckle for your day to start off. Um, let's not get into politics. I was just having too much fun. Okay, here's a question that came in from Tom to start things off. It's a long one, so for you podcasters out there, again, I encourage everyone to download the podcast anyway because it helps my ratings. Um, he says, I think we have some good shifts due to the lockdown. There are actually accelerations in some fields like e-commerce, telemedicine, and work from home. There are other things that are tempor uh, temporary that will go away when restrictions are lifted or big players take over. For example, we talked about this on the show, Microsoft Teams or Google just basically taking on Zoom. Uh, I think Zoom is probably the best short opportunity we have for the next six months or so. Um, he also says food deliveries and at-home entertainment like Netflix. I believe there are some a number of companies that will cool off significantly during the next six months. What ones do you see as short Targets, Kind of a tricky one. Zoom, it'd be my number one by a long shot. I just think it's an easy replicated model. I think that we'll probably, uh, um, yeah, yeah Tom, Tom gets extra points for the wordiness of it. <laughs> um, Zoom, I think, is the easy one because if I'm Microsoft or Google right now, I am saying, guys, here's, here's $10 million. Go and build this platform. Do what you got to do, but I want Zoom out of the way and we'll dominate it. And I think that Microsoft will probably... Um, have a bigger push because it ties right into their office products and, and Outlook and things like that. So I think Zoom will probably be the biggest short. Um, otherwise, I think that commercial real estate would be my other area of big one. And that's kind of challenging because how do you find those specific firms? You could go out and look at an ETF like NetL, and ETL, um, which is a commercial real estate fund. And I think that as we look at the points that Tom makes here, which I think are very valid. So many of us have now the ability to work from home and get away from a physical brick and mortar building. And I know that a lot of these companies are going, hey, wait a minute, we're renting out this office space for $30,000 a month. We might be able to just do a corporate headquarters, you know, one tenth the size, maybe spend five grand a month. That's 25 grand extra. Maybe we help our employees with a little bit of equipment to work remotely. But, you know, so many people are working remotely now. I can do almost every single thing that I do for Online Trading Academy from my house, except I do need to go into the studio and record some videos every now and again. But I, they don't really need that office space anymore. So I think this will be one of the big changes. It'll be interesting to see what happens to the value of a lot of this commercial real estate I, we've already seen it drop and I'll bring up net L as an example I'm really kind of shocked that this one has been bouncing up as much as it has here's N E T L which is uh, net lease corporate real estate I'm surprised it's even back up to 25 bucks now you guys can see it fell from 30 down to around uh, in the 13 range so a monster drop back in February and March but to me, it's kind of surprising that it's actually bounced back up this far. I'm really just traversing sideways at 25 bucks right now. But I think if we continue to see the trends that are there right now, that are in place right now, which are so many people working remotely, um, you know, some are going to go back to work, but I just don't see corporate real estate doing that well. Now, of course, that also could be uh, accelerated by another round of freeze, right? We're hearing about so many other countries and now certain parts of the U.S. spiking in the number of COVID cases, and that could bring in another period where we are forced to not go out. Restaurants are closed, etc. So, um, yes, I, I had to truncate you a little bit, Tom. You got wordy on me. We could talk about the DoorDash IPO in a minute, um, but I think that this would be a great short candidate. And then the other one, which I think a lot of people are going to go, no, 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 no. 
you're wrong, Merle. And I'd love to debate, but just please, let's make it friendly debate here as to why you think this. But here's my argument as to other areas to short. I think you short all the FANG stocks. Here's why. In this COVID era, everything shut down. So there was this instant reaction to go to online digital companies. And of course, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Netflix, were all reaping the rewards of that. However, in that process, a lot of those companies that were other members of the S&P 500, not the FANG stocks, were significantly oversold and you know, kind of the, the black sheep, if you will, because, well, they're physical brick and mortar and things like that. As we start to come out of this, which at some point I know we will, there will be that return to normality and a lot of those stocks have been underperforming, will get purchased again. Because I think if you're an institutional investor, you're gonna look and go, okay, at a certain point, I know that the, the FANG stocks, which have dragged this market up, will fall out of favor. It's just bound to happen. Not to say that they have peaked forever, but they'll sell off and then they'll get another rally back up. When that happens, I, I as a fund manager would wanna position myself in underperforming securities, which might have a lot to benefit from this market coming out of COVID. Uh, some of those ones, you know, airlines, right? As we start to beat COVID and have the security measures in place and things feel, people feel comfortable traveling, then all of a sudden airline stocks will start to do uh, much better. And they, they certainly have bounced, but I think there's a long way to go. Um, you know, we're talking theaters, entertainment companies, think companies like Disney, which of course we saw their earnings report the other night. Here is Disney's chart. Um, it, it's still performing very well, but it's, it's not at its all-time highs. I, again, I'm surprised that Disney has performed this well, given the shutdown of most of their theme parks around the world, which I know are bringing in some pretty damn good money. Um, let's look at JETS. This is a, an airline ETF. You know, this is another one that is still, in my opinion, pretty undervalued. It went from 32 back in January, fell all the way down to lows of sub-12. Uh, now you're at 20. You're still very undervalued on a lot of these companies. And I think that there will be a rotation where you'll start to see um, more money come back into those if that veil of COVID is lifted. Of course, it sounds right now, the forecasts are that for November, it's going to be atrociously bad for the COVID virus. Um, there, I mean, who knows how they come up with these forecasts, but right now everybody's saying it's going to be a pretty darn ugly uh, November and December. Hey, you know what? I'm not going to live in fear. Let's just see how it all pans out. So to me, um, to, ooh, that's a small batch of some pretty good stuff. Um, it's a it's a Elijah Craig small batch, uh, Big Ab. I'm not sure what what age. So that's it for me. I was I was trying to think of other specific companies. Zoom is the only one that just screams to mind because not only was it there the perfect place at the perfect time, but you have some of the biggest competitors with the deepest pockets in the world ready to crush them. Um, I thought maybe Netflix, but you know what? Netflix is a unique model. Because Netflix isn't one of those things where people go, well, we're done with COVID, I'm just going to get rid of it. Eh, it's 10, 12, 15, 20 bucks a month. It's that residual payment thing that most people aren't going to cancel that. So I don't, I don't see Netflix taking a big dive uh, on the return to normality. Um, restaurants, I think we talked about uh, the companies which might benefit as we come out of this. So Tom, you're asking specifically about shorting opportunities. I think commercial real estate, I think Zoom. Um, I don't really think home delivery companies like DoorDash, uh, who's looking to do their IPO, would uh, would necessarily tank a bunch. Some people are just addicted and now becoming hermits, not wanting to leave their house and using DoorDash and um, Postmates and all these others and Grubhub and Uber Grub or Uber Eats to just stay at home. Now, I do agree with you. I think that this is, could not be a more perfect timing. Probably two months ago would have probably been more perfect for DoorDash to do their IPO. But uh, yeah, why not do it right now and cash in and make just millions and millions of dollars if I was a CEO. So that's it. What do you? What else do you guys think? Uh, for everybody out there, you know, why not? You guys are all traders. So is there something out there that you think, hey, in my belief, if we come out of this COVID, these companies are going to absolutely dump. I, I might be missing something, but I was just running ragged here at the end of this trying to get the show ready today and I just maybe it's slipping my mind but that's kind of all I have is commercial real estate zoom um, and I think for me there's really actually more possibility for nice upside movers as a whole with these indexes if there's a rotation out of those fang stocks which I think have been pumped up a little bit too much all right let me see um, Merlin, what's your uh, Anthony uh, let, let me get to the candlesticks I have a candlestick question which is uh, coming up here in just actually it's the next question from Adam so I'll get to that one in just a sec um, 
Well, Jorge, we will. I think there'll always be a brick and mortar piece to Online Trading Academy. Um, that's you know one of the things that puts us miles above any other school. Most of them are just going to be online. You never actually get physical contact. Uh, I was at the office today, and there were a bunch of students walking around. It's just very different because it's much smaller class sizes. You know, everyone's wearing masks, so it's a little bit hard to see if someone's smiling at you or not. But um, yeah, to me, nothing really replaces the face-to-face -face brick and mortar education, which is why I did that event in Irvine a couple weeks ago. Um, Baldhead B says IYR. That's another real estate one. Um, which I think what you got to be careful is the um, you know when you're looking at real estate, don't necessarily say real estate as a whole. You have to look at which sector specifically. I don't think residential real estate is going to take a hit here anytime soon, but I think commercial is definitely the one that is going to be heading for some downside movement. All right, yeah, GrubHub is another good one. All right, let me go to another question here. And if you guys have any thoughts on companies that you think might really take it in the shorts, no pun intended, here to the south side, let me know and we'll bring up the charts and see what we think about those ones. I might be missing some stuff. You know, it's the whiskey. I know. No one smiles at me, Richard. I'm just a grumpy old man. All right, let's go to my next question. Adam sent this actually just an hour or so ago. So thanks for the. I worked on this one last minute. He says, a buddy, uh, a a buddy of is long, so I'm worried about uh, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, um, and was pointing out the bullish Harami on the close today. Uh, not quite understand the significance. Is that bullish to you? Okay, let's go to uh, let's go check that one out. So I will bring up Regeneron, R E G N, I believe. Yeah, there's Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. Okay. Um, as far as it looking bullish, maybe what I need to do is explain Japanese candlesticks, or at least what a harami is. Okay, um, I will. I'll, I created a simple graphic here for both of you who are can see colors and those of us who cannot see colors. So this is a bullish harami. What you have, I'll, I'll start with the left side and I'll work my way to the right side. Left side, you have a red candle and then a small green candle that fits completely within the previous candle. That's really the key here. Is you notice that this candle here, the green one. All right, all of it, all of that fits inside this red candle. It just goes right inside it. So if it was outside the, the tails of this one, it wouldn't be a bullish or bearish harami. In this case, it's a bullish harami just with these two candles. However, that doesn't tell you a lot about this security. It doesn't tell you a lot about um, the trajectory or how strong it's going to move or anything like that. So it's important to understand the context of it. Now, the one on the right-hand side is the exact same thing. It's just... Um, black and white chart. So normally a black candle would be the equivalent of a red candle and a white candle is the equivalent of a green candle. So they're the same thing. Some of us just can't see red and green very well. So a lot like to go with the black and white candles as I do. So when you look at a Harami formation, you, you can't really say, oh, it's a Harami. I mean, yes, by the book, these two candles together make that formation. And by the way, Harami in Japanese means pregnant. So again, you're looking at a little, little, little baby bump right here, which might birth a new trend, theoretically, to the upside. That's what the, the belief system is, that once it gets above these highs, it'll start to show some upside movement. Now, the most important thing here, in my opinion, is not just the, the two candles themselves, it's the prevailing trend coming into it. So you notice I put this little downtrend kind of icon to show that if you see this at the bottom of a downtrend, that's where it has more power. If you see a harami for a bullish harami formation at the top of an uptrend it's not as powerful it's not really useful it's designed to signify a change in trend and the whole premise is it's been selling off in price you have this big aggressive red down day and then the next candle is kind of a small hesitation it basically is that the slowing of the uh, the roller coaster right is you're you're going up 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 it's going click 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 and all of a sudden it pauses for a second you feel weightless and then it starts to move that weightlessness is this small little candle here where it's saying all right it's no longer going down. It's hesitating. Could it move to the upside? Certainly it could. Set yourself some rules and trade accordingly. Now, the other side of this is the bearish harami, which is exactly the opposite thing. You have something that's been moving up in trend, and then the next candle is a small one that goes completely inside the previous candle. That is the basics of a bearish harami or a um, bullish harami. So, uh, Jeff says, does that have to be at the bottom of a move? It doesn't have to be. But if we're grading things, and all of you Online Trading Academy graduates, you've done this, you know, you use odds enhancers and you go through that list of your odds enhancers to put the probability in your favor. If I see a Harami in bearish or bullish in the middle of sideways trading, do I really care? I don't. 
I want the extreme. I mean, obviously we're try not trying. I mean, we'd like to buy at the bottom and sell at the top, and the Harami helps us out with that. So let me uh, bring up the chart here and show you Regeneron because I'm not a fan of Regenerons at all. Let's take a peek at the overall trend here for Regeneron. I don't think I necessarily need to be drawing trend lines on this for you guys, but you get an idea if I was to come up here at the peak and we could draw loosely draw those trend lines. Um, what a lot of people like to do is create an offset, which will just create a new parallel, and I'll bring that down here. Um, and some would say, there you go, now you have your channel. Well, to me, this bullish Harami is kind of in the middle of this channel. If I was looking for it to move to the upside, I don't have too far before it starts to hit this upward uh, this downward trend line. So I'm really not that excited about Regeneron. Could it move up on Monday? Sure. It could move up just as easy as it could move down. I don't see any value added to this one. Now I run scans every day and one of the ones that popped on my list, um, I can actually show you this one here. Let's see uh, where we got. There's hammers, hammer, shooting star, and there's bullish Harami. Okay, so bullish Harami. Uh, one I looked at today, this one I like, right? Notice I've got this aggressive sell-off, uh, bear with me, aggressive sell-off yesterday, two days worth of really big selling coming in. We have it, it actually closed this gap on yesterday's candle and today we get a little bit of a Harami. Now the challenge, some of you are gonna ask me is, well, this green candle, including the tails, does not fit inside the red real body. Yeah, but it fits inside the, the range, which is the, including the tail. So I'll let this one slide. The reason I like this is, you know, look at the trend of CMS. You know, and again, we could be very loose here. You could put it through that point. You could put it through here. Bottom line is it's trending up and I would expect there to be some sort of bounce. So I've got an uptrend. I've got a sell off into an uptrend. I have a bullish formation right after it closed the gap. So something like this would be a much better opportunity or at least draw my attention to it on Monday's trading session, if that makes sense to everybody. You know, that, that that's important to say that it's not just a Harami formation. It's like a good business location, location, location. Now let's, just for fun, let's go look at some of these other ones, right? So here is uh, Norton LifeLock. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not really that big of a fan here because look what it's done. It's sold off, it's kind of chopping sideways, so who cares, right? I wanna utilize a Harami formation like this as a reversal. While it may work on Monday, I don't know, it just doesn't have a lot of power. Intel, now Intel looks a little bit better, why? because we've been on this big downtrend, we've been making lower lows, lower highs for the better part of uh, six months. All of a sudden today, or actually yesterday, it sold off and then it didn't make a new low. And you have to step back for a second and say, could this be the turning point for Intel? Could this be the bottom where it finally bases and starts to turn and rally and then say, okay, we'll be a competitor with AMD again since we've uh, lost all of our luster? Maybe. Um, I don't know, only the future will hold and maybe I'll put a little note on my desk here to check this one in a week or two so we can look and see what Intel has done. But that formation right there is rather positive. You know, maybe you're looking as a long-term investor as a potential buy point. The risk is Intel looks like crap, right? You can go all, the, this entire year Intel has been pretty, pretty bad. Um, just been selling off, lower highs, lower lows. Now that one little Harami doesn't mean that this is all over, but it could be. And of course, that's kind of the opportunity we have to take. I think uh, was it Buffett who said, "When there's blood in the streets, that's that's when you want to try buying." Um, well, there's a lot of blood in the streets for an Intel investor, as this security has just been selling off and selling off and selling off. So uh, that's a good one. What about Oracle? I don't need to go through all of these, but I will just for fun go through a few more. Oracle's going sideways right now. That is a bullish Harami. I don't care. It doesn't benefit me. All right, we already talked about CMS, which I do like. Um, C. H. Robinson. Similar to Intel, just not as powerful. It has this kind of rounded bottom here. Same picture, close the gap from all the way back here on July 27th. And you know, I like that initial close, started to move up. Um, this actually might also be a decent play to the upside here, because you do have a closed uh, gap to close at 100. Anyway, I could ramble on and on and on about these patterns, but that's the basics of what I'm seeing out there with regards to uh, those specific formations. Now. There was a question that came through here. Oh, where was that one? You're gonna make me scroll back to try to find it. Asking about my hierarchy of candlestick pattern. It was from Anthony. Anthony says, what is your candlestick formation hierarchy in terms of significance? Hammers, engulfings, piercings, etc." I think it's really tough for me to, to put those in a list because if you think about what they are, all Harami or all candlestick formations are are a result of price action and that price action is a result of what? 
Human behavior, buyers and sellers, period. So for me, it's just a snapshot of what they're doing. They're going to be lagging for the most part. My favorite, hammer formations, shooting stars. They're the simplest, it's one candle. However, for a shooting star formation to form, it has to have shot up, had a big green candle, then came all the way back down and closed near the lows. That's all lost opportunity. Now, if you can do that in a, um, uh, and with like a, in a supply zone, then you've got a great trade. I'll give you an example. Um, if you look at the NASDAQ this week, you know, we, um, let me go to the N N NQ. You know, you had a, a situation where it kind of got there. Um, unfortunately, on the daily here, that you see this big red candle. Um, that's because of the way the futures market closed. But at one point, this was a big shooting star. It opened right here where my cursor is. It shot up directly into a supply zone. And when it came back to here, it was a giant shooting star. Um, you know, I didn't trade the shooting star. I traded the supply zone. I traded as it came back up to 12,400. You know, the, well, with the limit order just sitting there. But that's, um, to me, all that, you had, uh, what, 225 points left on the table if you waited for this thing to form a shooting star formation. Now, um, there were no shooting stars on my watch list today. Let me see if I can find you some hammer formations, which there was a couple. None of them were good, by the way. Twitter, TWTR. So here's a hammer formation on Twitter. Um, you know, this wasn't great from any perspective. It didn't come down in a demand zone. It just really just, you know, it's in the middle of sideways action. So boom, done. I mean, big deal. Uh, well, not really bragging, Pepe, just kind of illustrating that if you look, look at a hammer formation and if you are trading the hammer formation correctly, you're late, you're chasing it. Whereas if you're using a demand zone or a supply zone, that was just a good recent example uh, on the NQ. Um, where I was trading the level and it ultimately ended up being a shooting star. How about Adobe? I think you guys all agree that this is not in a downtrend anymore, right? <laughs> Twitter is a loser without Trump. Boy, yeah, I, isn't it funny all of a sudden right away there's like limits on his accounts and they're, they're, they're you know, censoring his tweets. It's like, uh, just, I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I just would love to see whoever it was that won, you bow out gracefully and you say congratulations and you just move on and you call it a day. But anyway, um, this neither one of these hammer formations are good to me. So for um, the question that came through earlier from Anthony, number one in my book would be shooting stars and hammer formations. After that, I actually do like Haramis, both bullish and bearish Haramis. Engulfings would probably be number three. And then after that, I don't care that you can make up names for any candlestick formation. I mean, you've got spinning tops, you've got the dojis, you have um, gravestone dojis, dragonfly dojis, you have hanging mans, abandoned babies, all these crazy terms out there. Just understand how to read price and I think you'll be much better. But the reason I like the hammer stuff is I can run a filter for it. I can just simply run a quick scan and those it'll pull up rather quickly. I actually have in trade station, as you guys can see, um, right on the right hand side, I, you can see I've got bullish harami, I'll make this full screen for you. Um, I've got bullish harami and bearish harami. There were no bearish haramis today and a handful of bullish haramis. Now, the challenge here with all of these is the trade station filter is not that great, right? It's not showing the best in my opinion. It'll show you some uh, and I look at them and go, well, while it, it came up in the filter as being a hammer formation, it doesn't do me any good because of its location. And I check that every single day just because, you know, every, I'd say every week or so, you'll find something that you go, well, that's a great hammer formation, and I will trade that one going forward. So, Scott, uh, or sorry, not Scott, a gentleman sent that question in. Um, where was that? Let me make sure I get the, I gotta get people props when they send in questions. That was for Adam out there. So, the Regeneron one, it's not really that bullish to me. REGN, I'll bring it up one last time here for you. REGN. Not that bullish. This is a zoomed in perspective of it. It's really just traversing sideways. Honestly, you could flip a coin and see where this thing's gonna go on Monday. Who knows? Plus it's a drug stock and I can't touch it. So there you guys go. All right, that was the first or second question from Adam. Now let me see what I got for our next one. I had a few others. And there's one that I actually think I'm gonna need the viewer help on, uh, which I'll get to in a second. This one, uh, is pretty good. A lot of you have been asking this and I, I apologize because I can't get OTA to give me the crypto class that I built. So what that means is 
I will probably have to rebuild that entire class from scratch for myself and post it on my site. And I think that you guys can understand that that's going to be a tremendous amount of work. So you're going to have to give me some leeway and grace as far as building that class out for people because I, I should just be able to get it. But, you know, it's, it's OTA's property and, and they want it. So Scott says, I'm very intrigued by yours and others' views on crypto. How would you get started if you were learning today? Number one is... Don't rush into anything in crypto. As you guys saw on yesterday's show, you've got these SOBs who are out there scamming you and they're going to try to take your money. And it's it's easy to take people's money in the crypto space and disappear. So you got to be really careful not to uh, rush into things. What I would recommend if you want to get started is just start learning. Um, Brendan is here with us today and he's done a tremendous amount of research on it. I have as well. There are a couple people out there that I look at and I just go, I think they're doing a great job. Although one of them, his kind of feels like he's becoming a little bit more commercialized and that would be Ivan on tech. So if you go to YouTube, see if I can actually, uh, I gotta bring my scary music. I love it. Uh, since that's on YouTube, let me see if I can bring up Ivan on tech here for you guys so you can see that one. He, early on, he's got some great videos on how to learn about it. There you go, full screen. Um, Here's Ivan on tech. Now he's become a bit of a sensationalist. He does a lot of clickbait stuff. Um, if you look here and click on his page, please take it. He's got a lot of really good information here, um, but some of it might be too advanced. It's his early, early stuff that I really enjoyed. I mean, it was really going to be um, the basics and fundamentals of what is blockchain? How does blockchain work? What are the critical pieces? I really like that type of stuff. For me, that's what I would uh, I would go back and, and study. It's, it's just understand the mechanics, right? Buying into crypto just because you think it's going to boom to me is a mistake. It's important that you understand what it is and what it represents, which is I've had haters in the past. Uh, one guy just was would not leave me alone. Actually was a, a friend of mine until ultimately he just blocked me and said I was a liar, which was interesting. Um, tried to make amends, but he just won't let it go. Uh, and it's mainly because of my support for crypto. And he's saying, it's a fraud, it's a fraud, it's a fraud, you're all gonna lose everything. And while I agree that there's a lot of cryptocurrency projects out there that are frauds, it's gotten a lot better now that the government's kind of regulating a little bit, not really regulating, but at least the ICO market, there's some scrutiny on it and uh, it's a little bit safer. Now that said, there are a ton of projects out there that personally in the next couple of years will all disappear, right? Most of them are, are junk. There are a few that are great. There's some great projects out there and they will continue to build. So your goal here is to not just buy one, is to kind of mix your portfolio and say, all right, I'm gonna allocate whatever, $5,000 that I have or, or a couple hundred dollars, whatever it may be, and build a, a basket. Um, I've already told you guys pretty much what my major holdings are is you know Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, Dash, Monero, uh, EOS is a big holding. Um, I've got a few others in there. I think I said Monero, um, but it's just to be a little bit diversified because I'd, I'd like to come out of the end of the tunnel here with regards to crypto holding the ones that are your next Google, your Amazons, your Microsofts, as opposed to the ones that are my, uh, my Groupon type of cryptocurrencies. So gear away from shit coins. Yes, many dogs, you need to treat them like hot potatoes. I agree. I, I totally agree. So I would start with somebody like uh, Ivan on tech. There's another pretty good guy. If you have any, Brandon, that you recommend, let me know. There's a guy, he's called um, Box Mining, I think is what it is, Box Mining. He does some pretty good info as well. Uh, there it is, Box Mining. And he'll give you a little updates on it. He's a little, I don't find him as, um, how do I say this the right way? I don't think he is as in depth in the understanding of the back end programming that Ivan on Tech is. But you go here and you can click on, uh, you know, box mining and it's some pretty good information out there. There's a, a bunch of others like Jimmy Song and some of the major major players out there. But you know, here's another interesting thing that you guys can do. If you go to Coinbase, um, if you want cryptocurrencies for free, I you know what I I don't like to really promote Coinbase too much, other than they're the probably the best biggest exchange in the U.S. right now. If you go here and you go to uh, products, you can actually earn free stuff. I've done it. I got like $60 worth of free cryptocurrency from them already. And what they do is they actually educate you and they give you free currency for paying attention. So for example, you've got Algorand. You can earn $6 if you take this course on Algorand. There's the maker token. You can earn $6. What they will do is they will give you 
$6 worth of that token. So now you have some skin in the game, right? You have a little bit of that cryptocurrency. So there you're talking at six, 12, you can get, I don't know what CeeLo is. Um, CeeLo coin, Compound, Stellar Lumens, they'll give you 50 bucks worth, 59 bucks worth of Comp coin. Zcash, which is a great one. This is one where you can remain anonymous. That's an interesting one. Um, but you'll see there's a lot of different cryptos here that you can learn about and they will actually give you some free tokens for it. So that's a pretty interesting way to get started. You'll at least get some education and have a couple cryptocurrencies in your portfolio to play with for a little bit. Obviously, my brain tells me that the, the best one, long-term performer with regards to a store of value will be Bitcoin simply because of it, the math behind it. When it looks to applications, and running systems and infrastructure, I think Ethereum will be number one if they can fix the scalability problem. If not, you're looking at something like EOS, right? There you go. Uh, cool, so what else have I got, uh, Brendan? Yeah, I'm gonna try to read through these. Uh, I know you have a bunch of info as far as uh, people in the industry that you get good information from, but um, the CeeLo Green, oh, please tell me it's not really a CeeLo Green coin. That better not be, don't buy it. Any some financial tools? Let's see. Aim to make financial tools borderless, easy to use, and accessible for anyone with a mobile phone. You know, and again, there's going to be so much competition in this space, guys. Everybody right now is looking to make a decentralized application that you can use for your phones, made for the financial industry, just like we looked at um, Ant the other day, right? Where the uh, Ant was uh, Alibaba's company, Ant Pay. Right there, that's pretty much what they're doing, and I could see a lot more money being poured into those types of industries. Do I think regulations are needed to help cryptos? This is a double-edged sword. I think that there should be some regulations in the space. I know that I'm gonna get some feedback from the libertarians out there, but I do think that there's too many charlatans and scumbags in the industry which could just, you know, ruin it for everybody. And I think that they've done a pretty good job of ruining it for the, the perspective of cryptos with regards to theft and people losing money by investing in ICOs, et cetera. So I think some regulation is needed. And I think it's actually a positive thing because by having regulation, it actually does show that there, that there is a belief that there's legitimacy behind these projects. I think that for the betterment of mankind and our economies, our markets, uh, these cryptocurrencies should be allowed or digital currencies should be allowed to, to grow, to build their platforms. Uh, and at a certain point, some of them may need to have regulatory bodies because of what they're controlling or the impacts that they're having on our markets. But I'm a big fan of decentralized networks. Let's get away from all the centralization. It, it's um, pretty bad. So yeah, I think that there should be some regulation out there. But again, when you look at something like a Bitcoin that is totally decentralized, the government really can't do anything to stop it, but maybe they could put some uh, guardrails in here so that things don't go off track. So I, I think so. Um, you know, and, and Brendan says, you know, I agree, you need regulation to legitimize the industry. Look at the regulation that's happening right now in the cannabis industry. You know, it's it was black market stuff forever. I mean, I remember all through college, you could you know, walk down the walk down the hallways in college, and be like, hey, I need, I need a bag of weed. You know, and here comes Marty. Marty's got his little backpack. Hey, why would you need? Now you just go down to the store. It is legitimized it because of regulation, right? And back then it was recreation, just being stupid. But now there's there's actually medicinal needs for it, a lot of medicinal needs for it. So you added regulation to an industry, and now you have a booming industry that not only is is uh, providing good for the economy from a tax perspective, but also for medicinal purposes. So I think regulation has done to cannabis and hemp what I think it could also do for crypto. And if we start to see more and more people get involved with crypto and accepting of it because regulation is there, then you'll really see these cryptocurrency stores uh, soar. Okay, um, let's see. Any other comments on that one? Let me know if you have a place to get started. Uh, that, that's kind of what I did. Basically what happened was I went to Thailand with a good friend of mine and you know got a really nice resort with a pool. It's a nice beautiful day. I downloaded as many documents onto my iPad as possible just explaining to me what Bitcoin was, how it worked, the technology behind it and as soon as I got through um, Satoshi Nokomoto's white paper on it, which I would encourage you all to read. It's hard to read sometimes, it's very math oriented, but the principles of it just made me go, I really like this, um, and you know maybe I don't think I'll get in trouble for copyright. It was I got it from YouTube or from the internet. What I might do, uh, if for those of you who are interested, if you email me at uh, tradermerlin at gmail .com, I'll give you a list or maybe even include the documents if I can find them. There was a couple papers on Bitcoin specifically that were really eye opening and just said, "Wow, this is incredible." 
and that really spurred my interest and that's why I ended up writing the course and I just immersed myself in it for a period of years um, and I really found it beneficial. So if you want, let me know, email me at uh, tradermerlin at gmail.com and I'll see what I can find for you. Yeah, Brendan says, Ivan on, Ivan on Tech Academy is worth every penny. Yeah, I, I didn't pay to do the Academy. I know Brendan did, but um, Ivan is a really bright guy. He knows so much about the industry. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. Okay, well, Thomasina, just email me. Um, it might take me a couple days because I need to go back to my iPad and find out which documents they are, but there were a couple there that were really, really good. And you got to understand that these were written probably three, four, five years ago. Um, there was one that was actually from an IMF meeting on cryptocurrencies. And it was rather interesting when uh, I read that because most of the board members were saying, well, this is used by drug dealers and gangsters. We have to stop it. And there are a few that are going, if we stop innovation, then we cease to be creative. So we can't do that. We just have to understand it better. And now you're looking at central bankers saying, hey, let's make our own cryptocurrency. My, how the times have changed. Okay, let me... Um, Call out to everybody for help on this one. This is something I didn't have a chance to talk to some of my uh, instructor friends, but some of you may know the answer to this one. I honestly, I don't. Otto sent this one to me. Oh, that's Scott's. Um, Otto sent this one to me, and I think it's very interesting. I don't know the answer. He says, on November 4th, I bought puts at 361 on Biogen, B-I-I-B, -I -I with expiration on November 6th. So basically, just doing a two-day put. I mean, that's a pretty short little trade. He says, it got out on November 30th at 330. Well, hell yeah, you did great on that one, by the way. Um, you did very good. Question is, if I left the option open till expiration and the trade was suspended on November 6th, so it basically got halted on November 6th um, and then reopened much later. So first off, let me show you the chart of Biogen because, man, I almost feel bad for you on this one because if you look at what happened to the price, um, he had puts at 360. And I'll put a line up here at the top, which should be... There's 360 is that line at the top. Says he got out at 330. I'm pretty sure you made a very pretty penny on this bad boy. All right? There's 330. Now, I'm going to put the cursor on here so you can see the dates. I'll zoom out just a hair. Um, that was November 5th. He says he got out. And it was supposed to expire on the 6th. But it, it didn't. My guess is that it would have expired at the value on the 5th. That's what they probably would have recorded for that value. So the closing price there would have been 329 at 328.90 on the low um, of this close of this red candle. To me, I assume that that's where they would do the final closing price as opposed to what happened on the 6th because it wasn't there. Now, darn it, if you just had it for the next month, uh, Otto, you'd have one hell of a winner because it opened up the next day at 223. That's another 107 points, and you're short. I <laughs> got some puts. Hallelujah. So, anybody know what would happen there? I'm under, I think, a closing price of the 5th. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I don't think they would give you anything later. Um, so my assumption would be that you would get the closing price of the fifth. I think I think most people. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, so Katut lives in Bali, huh? You know what? It's it's on the list. I've been trying to get David to go to Thailand with me for years. Thailand is honestly one of my favorite places on earth. I have not spent time in Bali. My really good friend Josh, who I travel a lot with, uh, he is actually in Bali. I think he's in Bali right now. He's been trying to get me to go to Bali. I just haven't had the opportunity. I, I usually go somewhere for Thanksgiving uh, and spend a couple of weeks in Asia for Thanksgiving, but this year I'm staying local, calling it a California Thanksgiving. All right. So I think that that does it for all my main viewer questions. Yes, that's it for all the viewer questions I had that were sent in. Um, there are a couple other people, by the way, that just popped to mind. Um, uh, what's his first name, Brendan Antonopoulos? Um, I can't, I can't remember his name. Uh, Antonopoulos. He is one of the the four most experts. Antonopoulos. Andreas Antonopoulos. Yeah, he is. Um, he's got a bunch of books out there, and he is. I'll see if I can find it for you. He might actually have a. Um, Andreas Antonopoulos. If you guys Google that name, he is also very good at uh, in the crypto space. Very well known. He's he's got tons of presentations about decentralization of markets. This guy. Um, so if you're interested in learning, oh sorry, if you're interested in learning more about it, uh, I would encourage you to check out Andreas. He is really one of the the pioneers of it. Um, 
This is just through Twitter. He does a whole bunch on Twitter, but I would go through his YouTube videos, like Beginner's Guide number one, right? And, and it's, he does a lot of stuff really on the philosophical side, like why we need a crypto space. There's a couple other people here. He says, also search for. So I don't know Ben Rothke. Um, Roger Ver is an absolute scumbag. You don't want to, you don't, do not want to go to Roger Ver. Jimmy Song and Vitalik Buterin are the other two that I would highly recommend. Jimmy Song is a technical programmer geek, um, but he's entertaining. And Vitalik Buterin is just a savant, um, bizarro, absolutely cr crazy, strange, but he is brilliant. Um, it might be too much for a lot of people to start with, with Vitalik. I would encourage you, again, go with uh, Ivan on tech. Look at a lot of the stuff that um, Andreas Antonopoulos has done. He actually has some free books out there. I think you can go book, oops, book.pdf, and there's a bunch of stuff. Mastering Bitcoin, he has that book out there for free. Now, it's it's fairly geeky, but you can get a lot of his, uh, his Mastering Bitcoin book was free, which I thought was very cool of him to put that out there for free for everybody. All right, what other questions do you guys have for me? I'm going to wrap it up here. What time is it? Um, oh, it's 2.41 already. Okay. Um, I'll wrap it up. Uh, hopefully, if you guys, I would follow Vitalik in, into gunfire. <laughs> I can't. Guys, there's. let me see if I can find the one video. I want you to watch this video. Um, Vitalik is a unique individual. He is, is very bizarre. So let me see. There's one that I saw... Um, a while back where he really starts talking about networks and it, it's it's interesting it's some guy sitting it's this one look at this here's a guy who's worth billions I mean well I mean not billions uh, he's hundreds of millions of dollars right he's in his 20s this is three years ago and I'm I'd Describe probably get in trouble for playing it. if you watch this video it's from the disrupt San Francisco 2017 if you watch this one just watch in the very beginning the guy who hosts it very on point. I think he's a VC guy from Silicon Valley, and he's just, you can tell he's precise, very well educated, you know, and he's refining his thoughts as he's going. And Vitalik is just sitting there like this, rocking in his seat, looking extremely uncomfortable. And if you haven't noticed the picture, he's got a, a llama who's a unicorn. I think that there's a cat riding his back. There are UFOs and rainbows and clouds on the shirt. <laughs> and why? I don't. G, G A F? Is that what you, you use the acronym and get away with? He just doesn't care. But as soon as he starts talking, it's just like this volcano of, of incredible math, logic, um, futuristic almost talking. Vitalik to me, I don't know if I'd follow him in a gunfire, but he is one amazing dude. Um, if you watch TV news, why are all the Zoom backgrounds of the interviews bookcases? Because it makes you look intelligent. Bookcases make you look smart. I, I Unfortunately, I can't. Can I do it on here? I have different backgrounds that I could throw on. I don't have a green screen, so I wouldn't be able to do that. But if I had a green screen, I could throw on any kind of background. Uh, if you look at the ones I use for my Zoom meetings, it's usually like a, there's a room on fire. I have the matrix dripping down behind me or fires or you, weird stuff. Um, but yeah, you, most of them are doing bookcases because it makes them look smart. If I'm doing uh, interviews for, of, of somebody you know, for a financial program, do you want me to, you know, do I look smart with my graffiti riot protest sign over here? And my uh, weird Auda over there with the map of the world, I don't, I don't look that smart. I like to think that the talk track makes me look smart. <laughs> All right, let me show you your economic calendar for tomorrow, and then we will wrap this show up. I, I, again, I'm happy to answer any listener questions. I'll give you guys another 16 minutes of questions if you have them. If not, I will wrap it up. But here is what we have cooking for Monday. On the earnings front, there really wasn't anything today that was groundbreaking with regards to earnings. Um, there is nothing on the earnings front from Monday. Now, I will say that next week we have a ton, I mean, a ton of major retailers. You've got Lowe's, you've got Home Depot, and Macy's, JP, oh, JP Morgan, uh, Nordstrom's. I always get Nordstrom messed up because it's a JWN is the ticker symbol, so I think JP Morgan. Um, you have Nordstrom's, you have Ross Stores, you have Walmart, you have Target. I mean, these are all major firms reporting earnings next week. And of course, retail sales numbers come out on Tuesday, so you might get a heads up as to what their earnings look like. I'll let you know about that on Tuesday as we get there. Um, as far as economic calendar, Monday is not that great either. You have manufacturing sales numbers coming out for Canada, which uh, we hope that they continue to move up as expectations are dictating here. Empire State Manufacturing Index for the US, which has been stuck above zero, but just barely. Um, other than that, not a lot of major pieces happening, just a bunch of central bankers around the world. You have Australia, you have the US, the UK, Canada, um, European Union, 
a lot of central bankers speaking uh, about their currency. So that could create some waves from the Forex market. Um, let's see. I know Ron. Oh, I was going to say, Ron, I, don't, I do not know Gilang, but uh, uh, let's see. What else? A question from Brendan. What is your long-term outlook on the U.S. dollar? Boy, I tell you. I mean, if I go long, long, long-term, Brendan, it's down. I agree with you that the dollar is just going to continue to lose value because of our central bankers and the way that we continue to print money. If we don't get another round of stimulus, if, if for some reason they decide to hold off on this next round of stimulus, I think you'll start to see this dollar rise because the expectation is that they won't be printing tons and tons of money and we'll get a short-term move up. Now, I'll bring up the dollar index here so we can take a peek at what that looks like. You know, the dollar really has been chopping sideways. It, it feels like it wants to go lower. It really does, especially since it, uh, you know, in, in October 31st, it didn't make a high. It, it kind of came up to that previous high from September and sold off, and it really came close to making a new low. You know, I've got all these lines on here. Really, there's a line in the sand for me. Let me make this uh, put it onto snap mode so I get the exact number on the Dixie, and that number is right here at 91.75. You know, if we get a close below 91.75, you know, I, I think there's definitely more downside movement. But I think you would have to have the printing press is turned back on and another stimulus. The way that the markets have been going, the way the economy has been going, the way the economic data has been going, I don't think the Fed needs to be that aggressive. I don't think that our government, unless you're a politician trying to get reelected, oh, but wait, that's over. I don't really see a need for it right now, right? To me, that was a tactic for them to make us feel warm and fuzzy about voting for the, the existing politicians. So I don't think that we'll, I personally don't think we're getting another round of stimulus. I, I just doesn't, doesn't seem needed given the numbers that are that are coming through. Uh, numbers are starting to get a lot better. We seem to be going back to normal. There you go. Sub 90 with stimulus, with, like Big Ab, I agree. Uh, I'll bring that chart up. Here is the, the daily. Let's go to a weekly. I think you're definitely sub 90 if we get another round of stimulus. Absolutely. Um, but I, I just don't think we're going to get that stimulus out there. Um, yeah. Good point, Tom. Uh, I said the best stimulus would be New York and California lifting the lockdown. Yeah, well, I mean, if you think about it, look what happened out there in Texas. Texas lifted the lockdown, and now they're, well, they never really imposed an aggressive one, but now they are the leader with regards to COVID cases in the U.S. So, you know, there's there's multiple ways to look at this. I still don't think, even with the, if we keep things the way they're in, in California, I still think you'll see things get better. I don't think we need another one. Um, what about, uh, well, there's one other thing I want to look at. Oh, uh, there were a couple other stocks here. Like, for example, uh, Cake. These are some other stocks that I, I just have a hard time believing have recovered as much as they have. So this is a, a weekly of Cake, which is Cheesecake Factory. The comp companies I think would benefit from sorts of lift are going to be your physical brick and mortar restaurants. I'm not talking about Domino's or Wendy's or McDonald's. Those are all drive-through delivery. That's easy stuff. It's it's Cheesecake Factory. Um, it's uh, you know steakhouses. Those types of restaurants. There's no way they're going to be able to stay in business if they can only run at 25% capacity, which is what's happened out here in California. I'm I'm kind of shocked if I look at the daily here that Cheesecake Factory has done as well as it has. DRI is another one that I think if there's a lift, uh, they could do very well. But I mean, they're already back up to their all-time highs. Kind of crazy to see you know Darden Restaurants, which is Olive Garden and things like that, um, move all the way back up. And of course, that has to do with the deliveries, etc. But uh, it'd be nice to actually see these restaurants get back up to open. I don't know why that popped into my head, but that's what, that's what I was thinking. All right, what else we got? Um, you should bring out John O.D. to talk about finances regarding election results. Yeah, I think John's going to come on next week Is was the plan for that one. So hopefully we'll get John to, to come on the program next week. He's now in North Carolina. He moved away from me in California. He's leaving me. Uh, all right. Well, we're keeping under an hour, folks. That will do it for your... Weekend edition, uh, be safe out there. Hope you all have a great weekend. Hope you're doing something fun, right? M protected with the masks, of course. But is there anything fun going on this weekend? You don't really have any sports. Got some football going on, but uh, nothing too exciting out there. So hopefully you guys all have a great weekend. Uh, next week will be a fun one. I think you're going to see a lot of volatility, especially with the retail space. Again, you're going to have retail sales numbers on Tuesday, and I think there's like 30 different retail sales companies reporting next week starting on Tuesday. And uh you know, if we're astute, we could look at the the retail sales report and find out where those sales are coming from, right? Who's making the money? Is it going to be the Amazons or this business or that type of business? And then you can almost forecast what the earnings results will be. And there might be some potential plays there. I'd probably be using the options as opposed to the underlier. But that's it. Oh, the Masters this weekend. There you go. 
All right, cool. That's going to do it for me, everybody. Have a fantastic weekend. Thank you guys for your support. If you like today's show, again, thumbs up. We always appreciate that. Uh, if you want to get those crypto documents that are very old now, but still might be beneficial to your understanding of it, you can uh, email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. You can send in any comments or questions you have there. Of course, any comments below the YouTube video are welcome as well. That will do it for today, everybody. Have a fantastic weekend. I'll see you Monday. Cheers.